Hi, my name is Daniela, and you are listening to the Audacious Path Podcast, the one and only podcast that is specifically aimed at adventure creators like you and me. Every two weeks, I interview other creators in the adventure sphere, and I ask them about how they started, grew, and monetized their adventure creator business. In this episode, I'm talking to Bryony and Ian from Red Sea Sailing. I was so super stoked to hear that they are professional editors for other big sailing channels, and from that editing experience, they have gained so many lessons that they've applied to their own channel. In this episode, we talk about those lessons and some of the things that you can do to improve your editing. And of course, I would love to hear what you think this episode as you listen along. Did you like the tips? Did you pick up on anything? Send me a DM, post a comment below, act the audacious path, enjoy the episode. So to start out with, if y'all could just tell me about yourselves, um, what you were doing before sailing, how you got into sailing, and what led to the start of your YouTube channel. Oh, big question. Wow. Uh, so yeah, I was um, an elementary teacher, so I was just playing with glitter and rolling around in leaves outside with four and five-year-olds and having a whale of a time. <laughs> Pretty much. Bernie had a dream job. Uh, I less so, I suppose. I, I worked in kind of audio and video and tech uh, automation, that kind of stuff. And I spent most of my time traveling around Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Russia. Um, so I spent a lot of time in planes and airports and very bored. Uh, and when I wasn't traveling, I was sitting back in our apartment in Scotland and working on a laptop with rain outside and eventually the TV on because there's never enough emails to answer. And, um, and yeah, one day I just had this brainwave and I was like, why am I doing this? in the rainy cold weather of Scotland in this tiny little flat when I could be living in like turquoise pristine paradise on the back of a boat somewhere doing you know the same job yeah. so uh, I turned to Bryony one day after her her day at work and I was in the car and I said you know I, I think we should um we should sell everything we own and live on a boat what do you think and I was like what's a stupid idea I hate boats we're not doing it <laughs> yeah that hurt uh so so essentially i kind of put the idea on the shelf i was like i'll try and ignore it and over and over again i just kept coming back to it and i couldn't put it down so i, I wouldn't say i wore you down but i certainly <laughs> wasn't willing to let go of the dream too soon yeah i'm like we've always both loved traveling so this was a yeah. way that we could travel and take our home with us so that we didn't have to be like living out of a suitcase everywhere we went and it meant that we could do it more long term because i think if we had just gone backpacking for a year or whatever it would definitely be a fixed amount of time and then we would be bored of it and then we would stop um so this was our way of making it last a little bit longer that's funny it's a very similar story to how i got into sailing at the time i was married and um my my ex did the same exact thing he was like let's go sailing let's go sailing i was like this is a crazy idea but um in the end it changed my life so i feel that really hard what about the youtube channel how'd you get into that Ooh, that's a funny one so everyone has their own kind of cliche response to that um for us it's kind of funny we we'd always been kind of fun with like I mentioned, I did lots of work in audio and video and things anyway. Um, not much in the way of editing, though. We didn't do any video work, really. No, I started doing some film work through school, like yeah. teaching kids how to film and edit and stuff. But it was just all for fun. But when we decided to like leave everything, go live on a boat, none of our friends were into sailing. None of our friends had done anything like this before. So we knew that it was going to be kind of different from what our peers would expect from life so starting a youtube channel is always part of the dream always part of the idea so we started filming the day that we shut the door in our apartment and left the uk to buy a boat so the the channel started the day that we set out on the journey so it was yeah. always part of it not that we knew if it would ever turn into anything but well. no that's it we didn't set out thinking it'd be our career or anything like that but at the same time we're we're the kind of people who things happen to us <laughs> Um, and we know a lot of people don't believe half the stories we tell. So we kind of like the idea that we would have some level of uh, proof. <laughs> yeah, proof. So someday I can be like 95 in a bar, all wrinkly at the end of the bar and going, I used to live there. And uh, when they don't believe me, I can pull out my old black and white photos or whatever the equivalent would be, I suppose, YouTube videos on yeah, some yeah. old broken phone that doesn't exist anymore. It's kind of grown arms and legs and it's just kind of become a thing for us now. So it's it's our everyday. And how did you develop your video editing skills? What what was that process like? As we so. said, yeah. things tend to happen to us. So when we first came out to buy a boat, um, it didn't work out. We ended up crossing an international border on a boat that wasn't ours and then ending up homeless. Kind of um, scammed. Kind of scammed, definitely blackmailed. And then we hitchhiked on other people's boats for four months across the Caribbean. So we filmed that journey. Um, but then it was just so kind of overwhelming that we didn't release them yet. We kind of took a pause and... Editing took a long time in the beginning because oh, it's forever. so overwhelming and we'd never really done it before. So it was taking us ages to make these episodes. And by the time we finally released them, we'd kind of 
it was good because we'd kind of got over the sort of emotional trauma of what had happened. Absolutely. Um, but we knew that we couldn't maintain that standard or that kind of level of work if we were going to be creating an episode every single week. So it, it was good in a way that we kind of had that pause of we filmed something and then we edited it because then we had to figure out like, well, if we want to keep doing this, we need to merge the two together and do them simultaneously. Yeah, it's almost like an athlete training for a marathon. You start off doing like 4K and then you go, man, that was exhausting. And you eat a bag of Doritos and then you do 10K and 15 or whatever. It's kind of been the same story. We, we started off really slow at editing mm-hmm. and then it's just gotten faster and smoother. And I think on your part, more than mine, Brandy's pretty good at storytelling. So you can tell I talk too much. She's quite good at finding the important yeah. points. So, uh, so yeah, kind of honing that skill to be able to tell a story has really been the big lesson learned for us. Mm. And so now you guys are editing for some of the bigger sailing channels. How did that, how did you get into that? We got really lucky. So we've, as yeah. I say, we've been doing our channel for a while and people have spotted that along the way. Um, and so we still do our channel. Red Seas is still obviously growing and getting bigger. But um, we, we were anchored next to another large channel one day and just hanging out, as you do, you know that. Uh, and um, we were just chatting away and it turned out they were in a bit of a sticky situation for timing. They had a lot of editing to do. Yeah, they were in the boatyard. And so that always puts like pressure on, you know, well, you want to splash as soon as possible. And they were like, well, we, we don't want to spend our time in the yard editing because that means that we're going to be on the hard for longer. We'd rather just get on with the work, but we have a schedule to maintain. So they just reached out to us and said, would you mind editing our channel for like a month or whatever so that we can splash? Um, and okay, so we were like, well. okay, I guess we'll try it. Um, and so, luckily, the, the styles were quite similar. So it was easy as a yeah. first one. From there, we kind of evolved to, we kind of chameleon to other people's styles. So if yeah. we pick up a new channel that we're working with, we watch a lot of their content. We talk to them a lot to understand how they like to tell a story. And then we kind of mimic them so that it's seamless that we've taken over any editing. That's kind of our, our MO. Yeah, the goal is always that the viewer won't know that, that we're doing that it. We're <laughs> even there. Um, and that's pretty much what every channel wants. What is the process like when you're editing for another channel? Like step by step, can you walk us through it? Yeah, they will They will obviously film everything um, and they'll, they, they will usually sort the footage. So put it into folders that are either date based or activity based with a title or whatever. And then we'll have a very brief discussion with them about, okay, this is the general story of what happened in the episode. Some channels are like really specific and they like, I filmed this and then this, and then this will happen. And others are like, yeah, I don't really know. I sort of filmed this stuff over the weekend, see what you make of it. Um, And so then they'll upload it, we'll download it. And then based on what they've given me, given us, I will take all of the footage and sort of sort through it, put it in order, build a sort of long form storyboard. So if they want a 20 minute episode, I might create a 30 minute storyboard um, and then sort of pass that over to you and you finish off the process. Yeah. So then I take on color grade, fixing up the audio and then crushing down that story to fit that time marker, 20, 25, whatever they ask for minutes wise, uh, and then adding music to it ins and outs, graphics, that kind of thing. Uh, We kind of bounce it back to them in rushes through the course Mm. of the process as well. So there's different stages like check gates, if you like. Uh, So if the client sees something and they're like, yeah, that's not really important to the story I want to tell, Brandy can re-edit that narrative and then eventually sort of hammer it into shape. Less and less these days, we get pretty fast at it. Yeah, but it's useful. Like if I've storyboarded something, we send that back to the client and they check that they're happy with the overall flow of it. Because if they say, oh, actually delete that whole section, then it would be a waste of time for Ian to work on that and yeah. add music and color grade it if it's going to get cut. So it's like, it's quite useful to have those two or three checks throughout the process. Yeah. It also lets them start to formulate. We give an idea of any voiceovers and things like topics mm. to discuss or areas we imagine someone saying, uh, but it gives them a chance to see the flow of the video and they kind of go, oh yeah, I would talk there. Ah, too many voiceovers, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, kind of a collaborative effort at that stage. And then a lot of it is just thrown back to us. We do our magic and then eventually we either supply a project file if they're working in their own editing suite or we give them a finished episode a lot of the time as well and they just upload it themselves and how long is that process Ooh, (laughs) it's really interesting because um because we edit between the two of us then um it it sort of sometimes can take longer if the if the channel have just been editing their own stuff um it takes time for them to upload and for us to download and then i like to edit and then the, like the following week, like Ian will be working on a different episode at the same time. So the yeah. following week, he then gets it. So it can take maybe two weeks start to finish. For, In calendar terms. Yeah. yeah, for them to upload us to get it, send the rushes, and then they're able to upload 
an episode. Yeah. But we it sort really of depends one. on their it depends taxes. on their approach, yeah. And we have this interesting thing that we a lot of people ask us for hourly rates and things. And we actually we don't operate in hourly rates. We work on project rates. Simply because we've worked really hard to improve the efficiency and the speed of what we do. So if we gave an hourly rate, we'd be ten times higher than anybody else out there because we do it in tenth of the time. Sometimes. <laughs> And if the project's poorly filmed or the narrative is particularly complex, then it would end up being astronomical. So uh, for that reason, we tend to just, yeah, we move pretty quick. But at the same time, as Bernie says, it's a conveyor belt system. So because it's got that back and forth, it can take yeah a few weeks. Yeah, like one of the things that we did in our first year of editing after we did that first bit and then took a break. In learning to, to crush down the process, we sort of just learned to make very fast decisions. So I've spoken with a lot of people when they edit and they go, well, I've got all this footage and I'm not really sure, so I'm going to play with it. So I'm going to try this thing first and then I'm going to be not sure about it. So I'm going to try editing it a whole completely different way. And you're just editing two different videos when you know you're only going to publish one at the end of it. So we've worked very hard to assess the footage that we have and then make creative decisions quickly and efficiently to get to the outcome so that we can then edit our own stuff or that we can edit another channel, you know, whatever it is that everybody can keep their timelines. Um, so that was like a really big focus was just That's crushing it. down that process so that we're not wasting time in it going, you know, oh, I'm so creative. What should I try today? <laughs> How did you do that? How did you squish it down? What are some things that you like cut out or you realize that you could speed up that process? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. Um, so in terms of my set of things, cutting down and crushing down that episode, um, it it's quite a familiar thing. You hear other people talk about it. You become quite ruthless. If it's not relevant to the story, it might be the most beautiful shot of a swallow standing on your lifelines that you've ever taken. But if the whole episode is about your engine bursting to flames, it doesn't match that episode. So save that for stock and use it some other episode. Um, so a lot of the time it's crushing down episodes by finding what content isn't relevant. Also, and we started actually on the extreme of this, I would cut out every um and every ah, uh, and you get nothing but a series of jump cuts. And it was like watching someone taking acid with LSD, uh, with LSD and ADHD all at once. <laughs> um, and it was really hard to follow. So being able to trim in the, the start and ends of clips where the, the person's doing that thought process before they start talking, perhaps. Uh, and equally, when that camera just kind of drops away at the end of a sentence, getting that B-roll in there so you're moving the story on. Yeah, it's weird. Mm. It's like sometimes, I mean, it's different editing our own stuff on other people's. If I'm editing someone else's footage, then I don't know what's going to happen. But if I see them start talking and then I can see on the timeline that the audio is constant and then it pauses for a while and then it's constant again, I just jump straight to that second time. And if they start the same way with the same phrase, then I know that they just messed up the first take and they've just carried on with a second take. So I don't watch the first take because I know that, well, there in the moment, they chose to do another one. So I don't need to watch everything. So it's just really little kind of things that become second nature. If we filmed it, then I know, oh, I remember I messed up that first take, so I'm not going to watch it. I know that I wanted the second take out of these or whatever. Um, so a lot of it is just kind of, yeah, it becomes second nature to see the habits in what the footage looks like when it arrives. And everyone's different on camera. That's the thing. Most people, like I'm really bad for repeating myself. So I'll sort of explain the same thing five times. Um, <laughs> and so when you start learning that personality of the different mm. channels we work with, you're like, oh, you know what? I know that channel. They never repeat stuff. They almost script it before they start. And that channel they're going to improvise 10 different ways to say the same thing. Um, and so you kind of just pick and choose the best takes at that point. Yeah. What about creative choices? Like you've talked about speeding up things that in my mind, they're like very like, you have to do this. You have to choose a second take or whatever it is. But what about like music and sound effects and stuff like that, where you get to be a bit more creative? Yeah. Well, we mentioned a lot of that is chameleon to another channel style, um, which has been quite a learning curve for us. Mm. And actually I think it helps our editing for our own content as a result, because we're learning, you know, that channel, they love soft jazz. This other channel only ever use orchestral music. Um, and then it comes down to dynamic and feel. So th again, that's kind of where my part of the storyline kicks in or the conveyor belt. Yeah. Uh, I'll look at things and if I know the, the channel is, or the episode rather, is needing some pace, that's where the faster music comes in or the more drama kicks into action when they're maybe going to run aground. Um, and so it's just picking and choosing from their kind of genre of music and equally their style of graphics, um, whether or not it's going to be get that heart rate up and get your heart rate running, or you know what, this is the tranquil moment before the storm. So let this be all nice and easy going. Um, what we found really interesting is that 
if a channel have not had external editors before, oh, they find it really difficult to describe what their style is. Because when you start editing, it's a creative process. You're just doing what you think works or what you enjoy. And so in the beginning, we talk very, very closely. And like you're saying, we try and mimic whatever style that they have demonstrated. So they might give us a library of music and we yeah. only pick from there for the first like three episodes. And then when we start to get a feel of what they like, then we can go, oh, well, I think this that you haven't used before, it would actually fit your theme. And sometimes you can start introducing things that they hadn't realized. So they might think, oh, we're, we're really, I don't know, we're really organized and we only ever film everything once and that's what we want. And then when you actually get the footage and you start questioning them on it, they go, oh, I suppose that's not true. So they might say, this is the only music we ever use. Oh, but if there's like a comedy moment, I would pick a comedy track. So add that in and, yeah. and it sort of helps them to like self-reflect um, and yeah. we can start adding in our own elements. And then we have that in the color grade side of things as well. We spend mm -hmm. quite a lot of time matching color grades. Um, and again, some channels are going for the really kind of Instagram bright bashing into your face with high contrast and other channels really want to keep it natural and flat. Well, not flat, but natural. Um, we spend a lot of time focusing on skin tone to make sure that people look real and not, you know, bright orange. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so again, we try and blend in. So we've had some clients when we first started with them, we've kind of guessed their color grade. And then they come back going, whoa, well, that's way too excited for us. Can you back it up, make blues more muted, uh, which is a classic one for the type of channels we work with. There's a lot of skies yeah. and, and <laughs> oceans. Um, and so, yeah, you try and color grade to them. There are some tricks to, to truly matching a color grade so you're identical. It's quite fun when you do that because you can hand back something that you know is 100% matched to their no normal color grade. And then you get the feedback of, ah, can, you, can you change it a little bit? It seems a little bit flat. You're like, I know. And you can add a bit more contrast in there and have a bit more fun with the saturation. Um, but that gets all techy really fast. So there you go. <laughs> you guys mentioned a couple of times that there's some channels that script, there's some that just hand you the footage, there's some that know exactly what they want. What I'm wondering is from a perspective of like my audience who, you know, they're beginners and they're just getting into it, which do you find to be like the most effective? And by most effective, I mean like um, in many different ways. It could be like it helps you edit faster it could make you more creative it could make a better story like overall um what's the impact of those different ways of doing it with working with you guys does that make sense absolutely yeah, yeah. and it's kind of a weird diverse question as well because there's definitely pros and cons to different styles oh, yeah. so i can't just say hard and fast everyone should be using a script it's just not true um so what we find is yeah the channels you have a clear idea of narrative as they're filming so they know that okay, the topic of this episode is probably going to be, I don't know, installing a new mainsail. Well, they tend to film things that are most relevant to that narrative. And then you can see that they've got a, a breakaway chapter where they go off to buy more parts, uh, but it always comes back to the storyline. Um, whereas you get other channels who are a little bit more scattered. And so at that point, finding that narrative from Brownie's point of view is more challenging. That's the thing, because we, ha we weren't there when they filmed it. So we're going from zero to needing to watch through all of the footage to some extent to then finding a story. Yeah. So if the people who filmed it are not even sure what the story is, then it takes us so much more time because we have to assess all of the footage that they send us. Whereas if we filmed an episode like that, then I would have a vague recollection of what we filmed. And as I'm watching some stuff, I'd be like, oh, I remember two days later I filmed that, which kind of ties in, I'll pull that in now but I wouldn't know that if I wasn't, if it was for a different channel. So, yeah. And I think that, so another example is there's a channel we work with who they, they kind of script all the shots they're going to take. Mm. So they already know what they need to film. I think that actually gives them a better work-life balance because they go out, they film all the shots they need and then they don't have to film anything else for the week. Um, which is really cool. It requires more creativity on their part because they have to literally imagine all the yeah. shots they want and script it, script it in terms of storyboard in advance. Uh, but it saves them a huge amount of time in their work-life balance. And then when we get, sorry, what we get rather, is if essentially a running order and we just have to put it all together. Um, yeah, it's maybe easier for us, but less creative. And yeah, less fun. exactly. It, it, yeah. it moves the creativity back onto back on the people them. who are filming. But I think ultimately that is the kind of client that I enjoy working for is somebody <laughs> who is aware of the edit while they're filming. Yeah. Um, because then you're not kind of trying to pull things that aren't connected together. There's some kind of flow some flow to it from the very beginning to the very end exactly and it kind of makes me think of, i did an interview with sailing fair isle and um i asked them if they scripted and i was completely surprised they don't script at all 
But when I started to dig in a little bit deeper, it was clear that A, they knew how to stay focused on one story and they were always thinking of pacing. So like he, um, Steve would say that when he had like, you know, they came in at dark and the, they had to anchor first time in this bay they'd never been in or whatever it was, that this would be a really high paced scene. And so he always knew that he needed to follow it up with a slow paced scene. So he wouldn't film anything more until the very next morning when he knew the sun would be rising, it would be beautiful and it would be like a slow shot to like, contrast with the previous shot yeah Yeah. everyone needs to let that adrenaline fade down you can't have someone having a heart attack for the whole 25 minutes of your episode it's kind of yeah letting that sort of cyclic process work where you build them up you let them fall you build them up maybe you cliffhanger them at the end for fun you know and i think because i do the storyboarding between the two of us when we're filming i that's what i'm seeing in my head so we'll film like a couple of pieces to camera and then i'm like wait wait, no we can't leave wherever we are because i need to get some b-roll shots or a transition shot into wherever we're going because i'm already seeing how these pieces fit together how has all of this affected your own channel your own editing oh wow uh i mean it's been interesting so for our point of view we get to experience we actually cheat we get to taste yeah. everyone else's way of doing storytelling and everyone else's means of editing so some people have different color grades as we mentioned uh, audio balance is another one. We see people who have incredibly detailed audio mixing for their music tracks. Um, and all of that is kind of fed into what we can then evaluate, kind of like going into a sweetie shop or candy shop and picking your favorites. Um, we've kind of, I don't know, honed our edits to take what we think are the best parts of all the channels we work with. Yeah, definitely. Like at the beginning, because we had no experience editing, but also editing for YouTube. And we had worked in like, live events and stuff before. And so we came at it from quite a high production mindset. And so we thought, oh, when we're creating an episode, like you were saying earlier, you want to take out all of the ums because we don't want to sound unsure. <laughs> we want to sound sure of ourselves. And when we edit for other channels, you you get the whole clip. So if they do a piece to camera, quite often it'll start with, right, turn the camera on, check the focus, turn it around, now fix my hair, have I got something in my teeth, think through what I'm going to say, and then start. And, and usually like pause halfway through whatever you're saying, go, blah, 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 no, I'm trying that again. Yeah. And then they start again. And you realize no one's perfect. It looks great in the edit, but everyone's messing up several times to try and get their message across. Yeah. And so you sort of, you compare the, the raw footage they send you to old episodes that they have edited themselves. And sometimes we would like watch their episodes, not just for the fun of watching an episode, but with a sort of editor's mindset on and you go oh oh I would have cut that out but they left that in or whatever and quite near the beginning we noticed that by leaving in some of the mistakes that you make on camera it actually makes you way more accessible to the people who are watching it because you're you're making an episode for YouTube people want to feel like they're there with you and uh and so even our sort of filming practices changed a little bit we sort of changed the the goal slightly from seeing how other people filmed and edited we brought more from our perspective we brought more personality into the video because those slip-ups and those mistakes and those oh wait the camera's not quite ready that's like brian says it's being human it lets people feel like they are Mm. on the boat with you or on the adventure with you at the time so it's definitely adjusted how we filmed from wanting to be like I don't know, production, BBC, ABC production level broadcast, you know, making for TV is very different from making for YouTube. And all of this makes me kind of think, and this has been something that I, I believe um, based on the research that I've done and the people that I've interviewed is that um, I spent so much time on the edit when what I really think is important is like, you've talked about, you know, getting better at the filming process and getting better at the the storyboarding understanding process. And I spent too much time on the edit. I spent probably two thirds of my time editing the video, but actually shifting the focus towards early on can have a, a way bigger impact. Would you guys agree with that or? hundred percent. Yeah. Capturing good quality raw. There, there's the cliche phrase, right? Garbage in, garbage out. So good quality input, will speed up everything downstream. Yeah. So good audio, good lighting, good focus, uh, good framing, and good storytelling. Yeah. Um, get all that stuff right, and actually you don't have to do a lot of work further down the stream. Um, you know, Our clients, if they could all do that, we would have an easy life. <laughs> and a lot of them, when they, when they say, oh, we want to take on outside editors, it's not because they want to have less involvement in the process. No. It's because they want to use that time to, to improve sure. their filming. Yeah. So they then have that conversation and they go, okay, we'll give you two episodes, You'll work on them. We'll chat afterwards. And then you can tell us what can we do that makes your edit process easier. And so then we can say, okay, well, you know, we're actually spending so much of our time correcting your audio because you don't use good microphones or whatever it is. Um, You know, maybe if you try this, maybe we'll see if that works. And so they 
they're sort of redirecting their time and efforts into the filming because they recognize that that's part of the creative process. Which, which a lot of people, that's the passion, right? They want to film yeah. stuff. They then have to learn how to edit. And I think something that important that um, you, you kind of said, but I think it wasn't highlighted is that the best YouTubers out there are constantly learning. They're constantly trying to improve their film. And it's kind of like this nonstop process. You don't just start getting successful and you stop. The reason they're successful is because they're not stopping. Absolutely. I mean, sorry, I'm talking a lot, but like, look at those early channels and early edits. If you go way back to the yeah. start of some big channels out there, what YouTube was mm -hmm. five, 10 years ago is completely different to what it is now. Before, wobbly cameras and iPhones were fine. And, you know, terrible storytelling and jump cuts was not a problem. Whereas now it's, you are watching a produced piece of, to get blasé, art. You're watching something that's very creative, very well put together and using almost pro level gear. But there's also like YouTube is so based on trends and whatever people yeah. want to watch. And so videos that were successful five, 10 years ago don't make a drop in the ocean today, but yeah. also videos that are successful today would never have been created five, 10 years ago because you think, well, the content is just so inane or the content is so out there or, the, you know, whatever. And so I think you're right that the, the creators need to be responding to what it is that people are wanting to watch because that's ultimately how their channel grows is, there it is. if people want to see it. And then that brings me to an interesting thing that I wrote down actually is that, um, my observation that I have seen, because I, I don't know if you guys know much about what I'm doing here, but I have been collecting data on YouTube channels for about three years now. And all I'm doing is just studying and nitpicking and pulling them apart. And what I've seen is you can have several channels that are doing the same exact thing. They they're, have good editing, good audio, good filming. But the one that will be set apart is the one that has something like a big event happened to them, like Sailing Project Atticus, or not Atticus, um, Bo and Brady, they almost sunk their boat and then their channel blew up or something along those lines where like a big event happens or they have a big dramatic story seems to be what sets channels off towards success. Um, but also on that same note, I think that having good editing before then is what will allow that big event to make your channel take off. Does that make sense? Yeah, I yeah. think storytellers first, foremost. Every yeah, it, it's so difficult to like, everybody is trying to figure out what does the algorithm look for and, and how can we be successful? And like you say, when you look at so many of the big channels and what gave them their break, it's not something that you can plan. It's not that the people who make the best videos are successful. It's not as linear as that. It It's timing and it's luck and it's where's the space in the market and what just happens to all together and where does the exposure happen? And, and then tell a good story and how you define telling a good story could be in the quality of the video, but mm. a lot of the time it is in the events and the narrative yeah. and the way you convey it. Because we, you know, we can run a grind and I can just say, yeah, we ran a grind. Or I can make out this big long tale of how creatively scary it was. And well, we didn't think we were going to, then we nearly died. And and I'm still telling you the same story, but you yeah. know, it's more uh, ear catching to say the least. <laughs> if you're enjoying this episode, then I also recommend that you sign up for my newsletter where every two weeks I share research back and tested advice on how to start, grow and monetize your adventure creator business. In the newsletter, I include things such as how to tell a story, how to engage with the audience, how do you promote your video, how to um, build an income and much, much more. And I hope that you will join the growing list of creators who are taking their business to the next level and creating a sustainable, adventurous lifestyle. Brianna, you mentioned just briefly transitions and you talked about how if you knew that um, a voiceover or whatever, someone's talking dialogue, it's about to fade off, that you will add B-roll at the end of it so it seamlessly transitions. And I'm just wondering if you guys can speak to transitions generally, because that seems like an area where I have not heard much about at all. Yeah, it's so interesting because when you're filming, like we might go out for a whole day, like filming a hike or filming a, you know, exploring on an island or something. And they'll get to a point where we'll both look at each other and we'll say, okay, I think that's wrapped up. We can stop filming for the day now. And then usually like if you're hiking, you you film one way and then we don't film the way back because it's like, well, everyone's seen it. And the, the pinnacle of the story was to get to where we were going. Um, and so it's so funny kind of living it. And obviously you do have to walk all the way back, um, but sort of going, well, well, what's the viewer looking for here in the story? And so, yeah, we'll, we'll think, well, what, what was the last piece to camera? So when I, when I pull in footage, I sort of separate everything into dialogue and B-roll. Um, and I will try and find like three B-roll shots to set the context of where the video is with maybe a voiceover over the top. And then dialogue will start underneath that with the first person kicking off the action. Um, and it's similar, like at the end of the episode, it's like, well, well, 
what's the emotion? What's the journey that the viewer has been on and where are we wanting to leave them? Is it setting them up for the next episode or is it just rounding off and saying, well, isn't this a lovely place? Or making it's, sure that we have nice drone shots or it's, whatever. It's, it's almost like thinking of it like chapters. So as that chapter mm. comes to a close, it could be an end of day, right? Or a time passer that you're trying to convey. So, you know, we got to that lovely anchorage and we settled down to sundowners or we found that perfect view spot on the mountaintop and we cracked open a beer. Well, you could just say, yeah, cheers, and then cut to black. And then suddenly you're at the bottom of the mountain and you're driving to another state. You haven't really given the viewer a chance to appreciate the change. So you can do a time lapse showing the sunset over the clouds and breaking through the horizon. or And you can fade that to black. And that suggests the end of time passing. It's got to nighttime. And then you fade out of black to your new scene, which is, hey, we're now driving from A to B. And as long as you've got something that suggests that and doesn't just go, that was a nice hike, crack open a beer, cut to black. And the next thing is, well, we nearly hit a deer. <laughs> well, you were on top of a mountain a minute ago. How did you get into a car and about to hit a deer? That doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, we try to use like as many different ways of transitioning between chapters as possible. So we yeah. might use drone shots. We might use just st- like steady camera, like you know, Time shot lapse. of the anchorage. Well, no, I was meaning separately to that, sure. just like a, a landscape shot. Um, or like you say, we might dip to black and let the music or the sound carry on as like a pause before the next thing comes in. So <laughs> makes me think back to when like teenagers are learning how to make video or do PowerPoints and they use the, the transitions like a wipe feature <laughs> oh, and they no. think, oh, I'm going to use every single one in my one single presentation. And it kind of, you know, hits you all over. So we don't use like those style of transitions. We'll just do clean cuts occasionally very occasionally a fade out some some Um, channels will ask for swoosh cuts and things like that so we do dabble in the other transitions but they can actually be more detracting i think is the point you're making from the story so we still kind of hark back to that television slash movie broadcast approach um where transitions tend to be more through dissolves or fades than they are swoosh and checkerboard dissolves and all sorts like that yeah um, but we'll use as many different types of like different styles of footage yeah. rather than, you know, types of cut. <laughs> and you can always make even a, a static camera on a tripod or even potentially a photo. We don't often do it with a photo, but a static camera on a tripod filming, I don't know, the clouds passing over a hillside. You can always use punch-ins and slow zooms and things like that to make them feel that little bit more cinematic mm. and bring more grandeur. So if you're on top of the Grand Canyon and you want to make the point that it's big, you could just have a nice wide shot. But what you could do is take that wide shot, start tight, and slow zoom out on that. So it's the same angle, same shot. You did nothing on the day, but you actually make it feel like, wow, it really is big. It just keeps spilling outside of the frame. Um, And I think a lot of times we are on the subtle side. So if we're going to do a slight pull out, it'll be quite minimal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if we're going to do something dramatic and play on the fact that we're using a transition, that would be like once in three episodes type thing. It's like you don't want to over like overuse a, an idea. It, it seems like um, there's two things that I heard um, is that one, you're spending a lot more time during the actual filming process thinking about transitions. Like when you think about doing like a time lapse, you have in mind that the scene is ending and you're going to be transitioning to the next scene. The best advice I ever heard someone say, and, and I've tried to convey this to channels we work with and we use it ourselves is particularly if you get to a location that's scenic or if you think you've wrapped up a chapter, let's call it in your episode, capture some b-roll of the location just set up a camera and let it do a sunset or a time lapse or capture that pretty picture of a water droplet landing on a leaf whatever it is you're wherever you are in the world grab something that could work as that nice fade to black shot or in in our own episodes we could often have something like that as our final screen as our logo comes up and our call to actions kick in so it's being able to capture those shots knowing that they'll have a purpose later and even if it's not in the episode you're working on it goes into your stock footage and it might be useful a week, three weeks, a month from now. Who knows? Yeah, we had to learn to do that. Like every time we arrive in a new anchorage, we make sure that we put the drone up if we're not too close to an airport or whatever, as long <laughs> as we can, um, before we leave. It doesn't need to be the day that we're filming. It doesn't need to be like, you know, related specifically to what we're doing. But we've found that we will we will use that drone footage every single time we grab any because it's just a good context scene setter at the beginning or whatever. So yeah. Somewhere with it. Even if it's during a, a dialogue that had really wobbly camera footage at the start, you know, we talked about mm. people tend to set up the camera, check their hair and then start talking. Um, there are times when that camera is still kind of getting focus and still settling in their hand as they've started their dialogue. Well, if we could put a B-roll of a drone shot that's scene setting, we're on a boat in the ocean or we're up a mountain 
surrounded by trees. That is enough that you can place that over the top of the good audio, but the bad video. And by the time that B-roll comes to a close, you can have a steady camera with the person talking straight to the lens. Um, so it's a nice way to hide those little mistakes and wobbles if you want to make it look that little bit slicker, you know? In addition to thinking about it before you even edit, you're also thinking about transitions from a storytelling point of view. And I think that's really important to emphasize because I see early on, like the, the first videos people make, they're just like trying this transition and this transition. And part of it is because they don't understand what a transition represents. That's it. It's, it's trial and error to find the one that fits your audience. Uh, but yeah, it's absolutely, you're, you're doing it as a means of carrying the viewer from one scene to another and, and don't give that jarring cut unless it's stylistic, unless it's on purpose, you know, yeah. uh, it's all great. Bang. We crash into something. Well, then that's a reason not to have a transition. You just cut to that car crash. Um, but if otherwise it's just the end of a day or moving from one location to another and you don't have any footage for that transition shots are the secret to kind of letting the viewer comfortably move from one place to another. It can be really interesting, like once you've started doing some edit work yourself or you're just getting into it, to watch other <laughs> videos on YouTube that are a similar style, like the same sort of genre. So it's not like an educational thing if you're doing a vlog or whatever like that. And just to try and reflect on noticing what editing choices they made and then asking yourself, well, why did they choose that? And it doesn't mean that they're right and it doesn't mean that you have to do it that way, but you can start to become aware of, oh, they chose to use a transition there. And, and when I come to edit similar footage, I will have that choice and I can choose wh what kind of style I want to go for. And, and just becoming aware of some of those decisions and the reasons behind why you would make them. And the more I get into film and studying film, because right now I've started an online um, film or cinematography course and like getting into that has made me realize like how much thought people put into it. And I think that's probably like one of the things I would emphasize the most is like, Think it through. Everything is thought through. Absolutely. Even down to the boring technical stuff. Are you shooting 1080p or 4K? What lenses are you using? Um, you know, we have channels we work with, like well-established YouTube channels that are shooting on a kit lens 35 millimeter, which just means that when they try and vlog, they don't have an arm that's long enough to fit the frame. So you get like a really nice close up of their face. And if they mm -hmm. happen to have been sweating that day, you know all about it. <laughs> um, versus using a wide angle if that fits your environment. Um, or you're trying to take a scenic shot and you're trying to shoot a deer or in our case, quite often a whale or a dolphin and you've got a nice fisheye le sized lens. You're never going to see it. <laughs> not a chance. Uh, so it's amazing the detail goes in. And for me, you know, my background is primarily audio. And so for us, audio has been key to everything. You can have the world's most crummy 8-bit video shot in an old Samsung MOA flip phone if you have to. But if the audio is good, as long as you use that video footage carefully, you can people achieve will great things. Up with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, people hang on, and you can turn it into a style. You know, you guys have mentioned a couple of times um, earlier on uh, emotion, and I'm wondering as you've seen different clips from people, and you've seen how they edit, and you've seen the choices that you're starting to make as you're um, being like a chameleon and you're copying their style. How have you seen channels effectively portray the emotion of the moment? And how have you started to as well with your own channel, whether it's through the filming process and also the editing process? Yeah, so um, it's been really interesting, actually, because we mentioned the different styles of filming, the preparation in advance versus doing it kind of on the fly um, in terms of, I mean, scheduling out and, and scripting or versus just making it up. And um, yeah, the emotion that comes across in the in the moment being willing to, if you feel like crying, let yourself cry. If you feel like it's tense and you're gripping the seat and your nails are about to go through the fabric, convey that just by saying it. Um, so yeah, when it comes to the edit, it's hard to falsify emotion. You can use yeah. music to fake a lot of it, but not all of it. And people will see through it. We can be the most tense, heavy bass string orchestra music on there you can imagine. You know, da 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 And if you're going, yeah, we might have just about died, it doesn't work. Um, but if you genuinely feel like, oh my word, what just happened? I can't get over the fact. You might not be able to convey it in your words, but your face, your tone, then the music will push that through. Um, I think that's it. Channels that are bigger and, and doing well at the moment, I think they are more willing to turn on the camera more often. Yes. So, Definitely. you know, we started out with trying to only film the good bits or, you know, trying to only film the bit bits that 
we thought were interesting. And then we had to realize that although living on a boat is normal for us, it's actually not normal for most people who watch. Um, and so some of the things that sound really boring to us, we're like, oh, people are actually interested in that. Or yeah. when something is scary, remembering to pick up the camera, even though you don't really feel like it, um, yeah. kind of being that bit more open. Because the reason that a lot of people watch our channel and watch a lot of these channels is not actually because they want to see a boat or they want to see an adventure or they want to see whatever it is you're doing. It's because they, they started out for that reason, but they're getting to know you and they actually, they just want to hang out with you and see more of what you're doing. And so the more you can be vulnerable and open <laughs> and genuine, that actually draws people in. Yeah. Actually it's one thing speaking to maybe the people who are just starting out in your audience. It's quite an interesting point. We fell in the trap and we've seen others. There's this idea that you don't want to show your mistakes. Maybe this is more of a guy thing. I don't know. But mm -hmm. when we were first editing stuff, and we're, we didn't know what we were doing a lot of the time. <clears throat> for us, we would bought a boat and we had a lot to fix. So there's a lot of mistakes made along the way. And initially, you wanted to make it look like, oh, I know this. It's yeah. fine. Look, first time I picked the perfect spanner for that boat. I didn't go through five to figure out which one fit. And you end up cutting all of that storyline away. And actually, same with jump cuts. You end up taking away the ums and the ahs. The viewer kind of wants to know what happened in the gaps. Because that's the bit where they see you. The script you give them that's all wonderful jump cuts, perfect dialogue. Yeah, it's nice to, to get the message across, but it doesn't let them spend any time with you. So showing your mistakes as much as those scary moments, really difficult to do. Um, particularly if it's a, a more dramatic moment that you know stuff has to happen quickly. Uh, it can be hard to remember or, or let your partner, if you have two of you, grab the camera. Sometimes it's like all hands on deck, just yeah. fix the problem. But uh, it's a really important lesson to be willing to grab the camera, set it up, even if it's the worst angle you've ever had and yeah. it only gets your feet, it'll convey a message. And you mentioned that like if you're having, like if you're you're gripping the seat and you're, you're feeling like stressed out or whatever it is, like talk to the camera and say that. Um, one of the things that I've been learning in the filmmaking course, and of course, I don't know if it applies to YouTube, so I'm still learning that, but they say to try not to tell those things, try to show those things. And so some of the tips, for example, would be like filming your nails gripping the side of the seat and, and filming yourself like looking scared. Um, well, have you seen that be effectively used with the channels you work with? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it kind of, we probably lumped it unfairly into those scene setting and transition mm. shots, the way we phrased it. Um, yeah, those more close-ups and artistic, let's say, shots, um, they tell so much more than words, obviously. it's Again, it's a classic statement, right? Images, a million words. Um, so yeah, in that scenario, getting those nice little moments is great. Sometimes you do have to rebuild them. When we've seen people do it, mm -hmm. we've done it as well. Yeah. You have to kind of remember what it was like and then rebuild that scene so you have your nails digging into a seat because um, you maybe didn't pause to film that at the time. Uh, so and that also can be just difficult. like, uh, you know, if that's <clears> going to be, if that's B-roll going to be going over the top of you talking or, or some dialogue going on, um, we would always shoot that, like shoot all of the dialogue, talk to camera, and then afterwards get the B-roll so that you can overlay it so that you don't start talking. And then while you're talking, the camera turns away. And if your microphone is attached to your camera, oh, suddenly man. your audio changes and then you don't you you have to put the b-roll where you shot it because you don't have, you have the choices. original yeah. shot of the person talking and things like that so it's yeah you have to get a little bit creative or cheating i don't know how it is to film some of the b-roll just after and then drop it back on top of That's a it. bit earlier yeah no, it just it does it really enhances that story really nicely to have those those cutaways as it were um because otherwise it is just going to be you know if you're a solo creator you're going to spend the whole time as just your face on camera or what you're looking at but by bringing in those moments, mm -hmm. like we used to do quite a lot of, we'd call them click, click videos um, <laughs> where it's like, we're going to go on a hike today. And so we would do lots of quick staccato shots of putting stuff in a, a hiking sack, rolling down the top, clicking it shut, picking up the bag, jumping off the side of the boat to stamp our foot down on the side of the dock. All of those nice little close ups in a sequence. And it just, again, it takes you on the journey. So the whole thing is the viewer wants to come with you, use those side shots and those breakaways to, to bring them into the scene. You know, you, I was just saying that you have to hear something seven times in order for it to become a lesson. Um, and you're saying a lot of things that I've heard. And the post that made me aware that you guys are full-time or you do editing for a job as well, um, one of the things I said, my lesson that I had learned about editing was that it's more important to portray the emotion of the story than actually what happened. And the example I gave was like a lot of people when they see dolphins, they'll just start filming the dolphins. But half of the experience is the reaction to the dolphins. And you're sitting there focusing on the dolphins. And sometimes what I'll do is like 
go back and like, you know, film everyone being excited or I'll quickly like pull the camera up and make sure I get people's faces. So um, that's kind of what it made me think of. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. That's, that's the exact lesson we had to learn as well. The first few times we saw dolphins, we were like, wow, this is amazing. Film the dolphins. When we looked at our analytics, people were dropping off because they were like, well, I watched the first three clips of the dolphins and now I'm just watching dolphins. I can watch that anywhere. What I want to see is you enjoying the dolphins. So we had to learn to like, okay, get the B-roll in case the dolphins go away. But if they're sticking around, okay, now I can afford to turn the camera around onto each other or onto ourselves and get that reaction and get yeah. that involvement. And that's it. Like you, you mentioned, like lots of different types of adventure out there. If you, if thinking nature is a really easy one. If you see a wild snake or a deer in headlights, that's very exciting, but they don't tend to move very much. And so you can be very excited about it, but you need to show that on camera. So you can get that nice shot of the, the wildlife but you're going to have to add some movement to it somehow. And that can be, you know, really artistically moving the camera around, but probably you're going to turn around and get the fact that you are amazed, shocked, scared, laughing, whatever. Dolphins are a classic. If you're on a boat, you probably all know this. Uh, On a boat, when dolphins turn up, you suddenly turn into a six-year-old screaming girl. You're like, (laughs) oh, wow, dolphins. And you play around and you dance and you try and keep their attention because it's so incredible. And, oh, this is amazing. And uh, so it can be fun capturing that on camera because remember, you have the power of the edit later. You can make yourself look cool if you're nervous, Uh, (laughs) but it shows the raw emotion of, wow, this is great. It's like talking to a toddler. You never talk in your normal voice. You always go up a few pitches, right? (laughs) Um, And you can just, you can edit to make yourself portray however you choose, but it's the honest emotion of the time that you can capture at that point. You mentioned analytics, and um, I think analytics is just like this intimidating world, especially in the beginning. And I'm wondering, how have you learned, especially with, I'm hoping you have access to like the the pretensions of the videos that you edit for other people, but maybe you don't. But how have you learned how to read analytics and pull conclusions such as too many dolphin clips in a row? In the beginning, we just said, you know what, we're just going to make what we find enjoyable because you need to do it for a while to teach the audience and the algorithm what sphere to kind of place you in. And I don't ever trust the analytics from one single video because there's a million reasons why you could be getting that reaction, but we'll do something for a month before we kind of take any lessons from it. Um, Our key one is to look at retention. That is Um, the king. Retention curve. That's of all the analytics that's in there. The one to start looking at from the very beginning mm -hmm. is retention curve because that'll tell you what's right and wrong about your video. Yeah. So you can see, 100% of your audience watched the first 10 seconds. Usually, you know, at least 50% will drop off within three seconds because they accidentally clicked on the wrong video or auto-played or whatever. Um, But then, you know, you've got that line. And and if it's just gradually decreasing, then you can go, oh, okay, well, you know, throughout the whole video, people were getting bored. Maybe it was just too long. But if you've got like a sudden drop, you're going, oh, well, let me look at, you know, seven minutes and 34 seconds and see what was happening there that made everybody either stop the video or jump ahead to the next chapter. Um, And you can sort of see from the shape of the graph, if it goes back up again, it means that they skipped ahead. If it just goes down, it means they clicked away from the video. And so you can go, oh, that's interesting. We put a two minute only B-roll of music, kind of a music video in the middle with no dialogue. I guess that was too long for people. And you can sort of start to shorten those up or spread them out or, you know. And it kind of starts to set your challenge. So using that retention curve as an example, because you could say, you know, subscribers, but if you don't get exposure, it doesn't matter. Um, at any stage, from day one, retention curve will tell you, okay, I need to try and hold that 100% audience as long as possible. So I'm going to make the start of the video more dynamic, more rapid cuts. Uh, maybe we're going to put some more exciting music on it rather than starting with a tranquil scene setter with a nice daffodil in the sunshine. Let's get this action ready and give a hint to what the whole episode is going to be about. Yeah, because you need to win that audience over your first a uh, chance to reach people is with your thumbnail and your title. And if exactly. they see that and they click on it, you've won them over partly, but you need to, to basically deliver in those on first 15 seconds. Yeah. You're saying, well, you think you clicked into a video that was about whatever. Now I'm about to prove that it's going to be worth your time to stay here and watch the rest of it. So yeah, that, that opening sequence is like constantly emerging and uh, changing the way that we do things and yeah. trying stuff out. But it's all about convincing people that, you you are worth their time yeah and like bernie says the thumbnail is the kind of the the first promise you make this video is about repairing x if your first 30 seconds of that video doesn't even feature x in it somehow people think they've clicked on the wrong video and they go back because like wait i'm sure i clicked on the one that said this is how to fix a thing and why am i watching nature shots that has nothing to do with the fixing 
So yeah, you're you're delivering on your promise, and then you're basically playing a game of setting a question, a mystery, and then answering that mystery. Setting another one, answering it. Setting another one, answering it. Uh, and if you can overlap the the questions, those mysteries, so that you set one, and as you're wrapping up, you've already set the next. That's you just teasing them along the journey to stay to the very end of the episode. Yeah, and my experience also is that your the pace of the story also needs to be quicker within the first like two to four minutes because like you really are trying to draw people in. So you might be able to get away with talking to the camera for a minute straight later on in the episode, but in the first like two to four minutes, you really need to make sure that it's like quick and snappy. Too yeah. right. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, most of the edits we do, we tend to have. Uh, like a well a lot of the youtube channels do this at the moment so we've been doing a lot more of them is the kind of coming up this week which is a big overarching review setting some of that mystery up and then you can have if you want to keep that pace up you can do last week and do a similar fast paced edit before you get to that first standing there holding a camera talking to it setting a scene Um, and that can buy you a lot of time before you even get into the meat of the video there are other ways to do it start straight in the middle of the action and then do flashbacks. Uh, there's loads of different edit styles you can play with to make that happen, as you know. That's interesting that you said that like doing a flashback can keep the retention. So can you speak to that a little bit? So we've done that like when we ran aground, for example. Um, we started by saying, uh, six hours ago, we ran aground. And then we cut back and we sort of, because we hadn't filmed much during the time when we ran aground, because it was stressful, we told the story to camera afterwards but then we used loads of flashbacks to B-rolls. whatever we had managed to film at the time. But it was a way of kind of bringing the audience along with the story. But what what we actually filmed, obviously, when we set out sailing that day, we didn't know we were going to run aground. So it would have started with quite a slow moving episode and not much happening. So we wanted to let people know that there is drama like this is all a setup. You're going to get you're going to get there and it's going to be good. And so that was our sort of way of pulling people along is like delivering a sort of hammer blow right at the beginning going there's action coming again it's the mystery and then the answer and it's just a way to kind of tease people along but the flashback is kind of a nice way to do often with a cliffhanger um like yeah. Bernie says the cliffhanger can even be to tell people the result but they want to know how it happened because that's why people watch vlogs they want to know how yeah based on having worked with many channels what's your recommendation around like those you know i don't know if you've seen them like the intros where it's like the same every time it introduces all the characters and tells them about the boat it's, it's, a it's dilemma. always a balance because <laughs> again you can use your analytics to some extent of seeing how many people are watching my video who already follow my channel and know who i am and how many people are watching these videos that have never heard of me so a lot of people who have these longer intros with a voiceover that says hi i'm Bryony and this is ian and this is our story for three and it you know goes on for a while that's really good if people haven't seen your videos before because instantly they know you, they know what you're about, they know where in the world you are, they know something of your story and they can kind of, your video becomes more accessible to them. One of the tricks that works quite well talking to what Brian is saying actually is you have a recurring audience, but there are going to be days where you've made an episode that you know is a big hitter. It's going to get you a lot of new mm. views. Um, I can't even think of it. I usually pick analogies to this stuff. I won't bother. You'll have something that you know is going to reach far and wide beyond your current subscriber base. Those are the ones to put in your, hi, I mean, this is Brainy, we live in a boat, blah, 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 because you're reaching more people who are going to be introduced to you. If it's just a, I hate to say, run-of-the-mill episode, those are the ones where you can afford to crush that intro down. Maybe it's just a hook. Maybe it's just a logo that comes up on screen. And that lets people just stay in the narrative and get to the point. Um, even TV, HBO have started doing that. I noticed you know, big TV shows yeah. pretty much just put up the name of the show with a, a thunder effect and then carry on. Um, kind of the first the pilot will have a nice 30 second intro sequence and the rest they kind of keep it snappy into the point no that's good and it, 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 it's some really good points there that I, I it all comes back to like being thoughtful again what about CTAs you guys mentioned CTAs what, is, what have you picked up on around you know doing a call to action how many where any tips uh, absolutely only ever do one <laughs> well one major one yeah so if you don't subscriber comes into that then that's more so subscriber call outs, if you're doing like a, a call to action in the bottom corner saying hit subscribe, we will load up an episode. So really early on, like straight after those intro pieces, get one in there because you need to get that person to be aware of you. And then we usually would put in three more. Yeah, sorry. I was meaning only one action. So don't tell people to subscribe and also tell them to join at your the same Patreon. Time. Yeah. yeah, sorry. At the same screen, don't try and put everything at once. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, but yeah, we, we didn't do it very often in the beginning because I thought that 
it was obvious because I assumed that everybody who watched our videos would be watching every single week religiously. And I had to learn that actually my perception of people who follow a channel is actually very different to how YouTube works. Um, and so, yeah, it, it is crazy noticeable how much of an impact using a call to action makes. Um, yeah. And there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Just putting a graphic on screen while the episode carries on or doing something like during your dialogue while the episode's happening or doing a drop in or doing an end card or, you know, a bunch of different things. But yeah, it really does actually gain retention. I actually just yeah. spoke to somebody recently who they premiered their episode every single week only for the reason that it means that they can talk live with anyone who's watching it and tell them to give it a thumbs up. And they think that enough people giving it a thumbs up in the first 20 minutes after it goes live gives them enough of a, a kind of return on investment that it's it's worth the time for them to premiere every episode. So there's loads of different things that people are trying, but basically tell your audience what to think and they're more yeah. likely to think it. Tell them what to do, which I'm sure you've heard a hundred times, but yeah, in, in call to actions, don't be shy to make them obvious. Um, we still fall on the trap that will rather than every single episode that we do, we won't put, you know, and remember to be a patron halfway through an episode because yeah. it gets just monotonous and actually it gets like that intro conversation. It gets annoying. So we can do the subtle one in the corner. But if there's a particular drive uh, right now, we are in a situation where we're driving for uh, some more patrons to be able to afford to replace our engine. So it's kind of justified to draw their attention to that and say, you know what, by becoming a patron, even at this tier, if we can get this many, that means that we can keep the journey going or we can do X or Y. Uh, the call to subscribe is very much the same thing. Be be willing once in an episode, maybe not every single week, but to throw in there, hey, and if you haven't subscribed, you know we're here every single week and you probably watch all the time. So why not get a notification? But um, we made a conscious decision that when we said, right, let's try and drive Patreon because we need funds for the engine, we were like, okay, but you know what? We're not going to boost our website right now because this one takes priority and we yeah. didn't want to confuse people with too many things yeah and um, same ago if you have if you're fortunate enough to get uh paid for advertising within your episodes as in a brand has approached you and said hey can you talk about this brand new drink you might find that you don't choose to call to action patreon that week because you know what you're getting paid for the drink uh or for the spot about the drink so again your audience it's, it's being respectful of them and understanding that they have if they give you anything, that's very respectful of them in the first place. So don't try and milk them for every penny they have. <laughs> How do you recommend someone going about finding a skilled editor if that's what they want to do? And I emphasize skilled because I have hired people that are not skilled. And I think that's key here. Well, email us. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that we can really answer that question because it's not like we, I don't know, have been working across lots of fields because we edit for predominantly sailing YouTube channels um, because that's what we do. So that's where we had connections. But what we found is a lot of people said they went on to Fiverr or they went on to whatever website to find editors and they found people who were great at editing, but they didn't know anything about their niche. Yeah. So they didn't know anything about sailing or RVs or whatever it was. And they just always felt like the connection wasn't quite there. The people weren't quite understanding, whether it's they don't know boat terms, so they didn't know what B-roll was what and they couldn't match it up, or they just didn't quite understand the lifestyle, so the, the whole kind of feel of the episode was a little bit off. And so then when we've come in, they've said that, oh, this is great because you understand the, the style of uh, YouTube channel that we are working and, within. And the delivery terms. Like let's be honest, we all love the idea of having a perfect bank of footage that we filmed six weeks out and it goes through a process and it's ready six weeks before it needs to go live. And that isn't always the case. Um, and so particularly when people are out and adventuring, you don't always have internet access. And so in, in what we do, we, we can adapt and work with people when they say, you know what, I'm really sorry, but I need something for this weekend. Any chance you could fire out really quickly for me and we'll just rush this one. We can adapt to that going, yeah, of course we understand equally. We're going to go away on passage for the next three weeks. We won't see land or internet. So we're going to come back with a bunch of footage. Can we just put that into the conveyor belt and you'll just work your way through it? Of course. Um, so it's, it's having an editor that has an understanding of your environment and actually your adventure, whatever that adventure is. So if you're into rock climbing, find an editor who understands rock climbing because they will see, wait, that was a really interesting move you yeah. did with your fingers on that hold. Or somebody's into mechanics. Well, get an editor who understands what a carburetor is so that they can see you're cleaning it and explain that better. Yeah. Um, I think that's kind of the key, which is hard to find when you go out into Fiverr and places. Um, probably even harder to find an editor at that point. So sorry, it's not the best advice. 
No, no, I, I think it's wonderful advice. The only thing that I would add to that is that like for a lot of us, we, especially the starting out that are trying to get an editor, because I, I use an editor, um, you can get someone really cheap. Um, and I rather than looking for their skill, look for their ability to take feedback. Because if someone's willing to take feedback, then you can quickly grow and learn together. And like when my editor and I first started working together, like I paid her not enough really. And now I pay her a little bit more because she's like, we've worked together for two years now and she knows how to edit to my style she knows sailing she's gotten used to everything and and in fact training an editor can be really effective in other ways too like they're not going to have the same skill as you but they're going to be able to completely like envelop your style if that makes sense yeah, yeah. If you get a green editor like somebody's just starting out and said hey i have a passion to try this obviously they have to have the spark but yeah you can literally together i think is the keyword you use there it's a growth curve of both parties. You can't come in hard and fast saying, no, it must be this, because then you may as well make the edit, yeah. to be honest. Um, but you can come and say, hey, I'd love it to be like this. Can you show me what your interpretation of that would be? Um, okay, that could, could it be shorter, could it be brighter, could it be quicker, interesting, whatever it is you want to tweak and hone. Um, and yeah, if both parties can come back, so then your editor can say, absolutely, I can do that if you wouldn't mind turning on the light before you talk or make sure your microphone is closer then I can achieve what you're asking for. So that collaboration really mm -hmm. gets you the results you're looking for, I think. Uh, I could keep talking to you guys forever and I love your energy. I can just feel how much you care about this topic, but I have to run. <laughs> how can people find you online? Uh, so our YouTube channel is called Red Seas. Um, sometimes that's a little bit tricky to find, so you can look up Sailing Red Seas um, or our website, red-seas.com. We put all of our episodes on there and a bunch of other stuff as well. Yeah, and then we're all over the usual social medias. We just we went for at real red seas, uh, seas as in oceans, S-E-A-S. Um, and yeah, we're on, I think, everything as that, mainly Facebook and Instagram like everybody else. But yeah, we're out there. So <laughs> drop us a line. We'd love to meet people. It's always nice. And are you up for uh, more editing jobs? Oh, always. <laughs> absolutely, yes. Yeah, it's kind of the way we're keeping ourselves going a lot of the time. So uh, yeah, it's nice to, again, we learn more from everybody else. So yeah, the more we can work with, the better. Thank you so much for having a listen. If you enjoyed this podcast and you thought it brought you any value, one of the easiest ways you can help me build this and reach more people is to leave a five-star review on Apple or Spotify podcasts. It helps this little show grow and also helps me reach more people who need this advice. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys and I'll see you in two weeks.